Welcome to Coffee, Eggs and Inspiration. It's a weekly show that goes out over YouTube and as a podcast over all of the major channels. And each week I get to sit with an inspiring person and listen to them tell their story and share it with all of you. This week is no different. I'm joined by the wonderful Joe Binder. Welcome, Joe. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Super exciting. Joe got the, uh, the, the memo about the black t-shirt, so we're looking really sort of quite matching here, which is a, a very good start. Joe's the founder and CEO of WOW, which is a personal branding and, uh, well, personal branding for founders and, and CEO CEOs. Uh, I will uh, put the link below so you can check it out, and I might even show the site later. Uh, he's also a mentor with Jump and a former YouTuber, actually. That's how Joe uh, learned his skills, uh, or some of them anyway, on social media. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Founder and director of Students Of, uh, back in university days, and he was a uh, University of Cambridge uh, attendee and, and now graduate. So uh, super happy to have you, Joe. We've known each other for, what, three years now? Yeah, it must be around three years. Crazy. Time flies. Maybe, maybe longer. Uh, do you remember how we met? I do. So we were at a networking event, and essentially we had the super experienced mentors, people like Craig Fenton, um, and then the rookies like myself. And the mentors would sit on one table um, and then essentially all of the, the, everybody else would rotate so they could get a chance to introduce themselves. And all of the, the mentors were giving a long introduction about what they did, who they were. Um, and a lot of the time we didn't know much about them um, and what they did. But when it came to Craig, he just, he looked at me and he said, uh, I work for a company called Google we have a search engine and everyone just laughed. I thought it was really great the way you uh, summed that up. Um, and from that point on, I just thought, wow, this guy is so cool. Um, and I think I asked you for your email, Craig, at the end of that session. Was that right? Yep, that's right. Yep. And then I remember messaging you a few weeks later because I had a bit of a business predicament. I felt completely out of my depth. And I messaged you on a Friday afternoon to see if there was any chance you'd be able to get coffee over the next few weeks. And you replied within an hour saying, sure, why don't we do breakfast tomorrow morning? And that was a Saturday morning. And I, I was just taken aback by that. Wow. That's right. We, we ended up, uh, what was it? We, we, we met at White City House and had a good chat. And it turned out, from my perspective anyway, that the rookies knew more than the uh, slightly more senior mentors. And we've been in that sort of two-way mentorship, I guess, ever since. Um, let's wind the clock back and talk a little bit about your experience at Cambridge, uh, University of Cambridge, uh, and what led you into YouTubing while you were there. Sure. So, I mean, I was never really meant to go to Cambridge in the first place. I was always the dumb kid at school. The banter for me and my friends was that I was the, the thick one. Um, I was in bottom set. So something like Cambridge or even university, which is very much out of reach for me, um, but I knew that I could learn faster I knew that I could do more and I essentially set myself this mission within school at around year eight um, to work as hard as I possibly could to do as much extra work as I could so that I could move up sets be challenged more um, and you know open as many doors for my future self as I possibly could and that ended up in me applying to Cambridge after countless conversations with my geography teacher where Miss Rusey looked at me and she just you know looked me dead in the eye and said Joe there are different types of intelligence. Stop comparing yourself to other people. You are smart enough. You are motivated enough. There's no reason that you shouldn't apply. Um, and after probably around four or five of those conversations, I just thought, you know what, I'm going to do it. So I applied to Cambridge. I got in. Um, but when I got there, I realized that all of the preconceptions I had about students of Cambridge, about Cambridge life, were just, just not true. Um, we've fed such a kind of narrow narrative around what it's like to be a student there. And I realized that there is every type of person at Cambridge, but when you're not there, you just don't see that. Um, so I started a blog called Students of Cambridge. It was modeled on Brandon Stanton's Humans of New York. If you're familiar with Humans of New York, right? Yeah. And so um, I, it's amazing. I was obsessed with it. to befriend them within 30 seconds and convince them to let me interview them and take a photo of them. 
um, and that would then be the content for a social media uh, Facebook page called Students of Cambridge, which we then expanded out to Oxford, Durham, Bristol, and Exeter. Um, but that started as a as a mission to show people what being a student there was really like. But it taught me a ton around first of all confidence, but also creating engaging content that is going to succeed on social. So that was the first thing I, I did at Cambridge. Fantastic. Oh, I, I don't know if you noticed that, Joe. Have you clocked it? I'm showing that. <laughs> I'm showing you a YouTube channel. There it is. I used to make videos about studying at Cambridge University. Now I make videos about running a company. There's some cool content. Actually, I've mo watched a good, uh, a good chunk of the lifestyle uh, vlogging that you did, and it's super high quality. If uh, if anyone watching is an aspiring YouTuber, I'd encourage you to look at how Joe builds uh, builds his stories. It's really, uh, really interesting. And uh, of course, there's some um, some more recent content there about your experience uh, as a CEO and founder, which we'll we'll talk about in a moment. What was did you see that? Um, did you kind of feel that there were barriers um, before uh, starting YouTube? Were, were you kind of embarrassed and a little bit self conscious to put yourself on on camera, or or was it quite natural for you? So I was influenced quite heavily by Gary Vaynerchuk. And it was the summer of my last year at uni. I was doing an inter a two-month internship in Berlin at a place called Rocket Internet. And I just realized that I already share my life to my friends and family on Instagram and Facebook. And why not do that on a platform where it can actually be scaled and I can start to build a, a real genuine audience. So I followed Gary Vaynerchuk's advice. I started a YouTube channel. Um, he was crazy about you know, document everything uh, quantity over quality just push content out there so my version of that was to start a daily vlog whilst i was doing the internship um and it was quite self-conscious at the start especially because i was walking through um berlin you know holding up a camera and having to speak to it confidently and just ignore the surroundings um so that that was an interesting experience getting started um but I had a lot of feedback from friends throughout that process um, and essentially people didn't care about my life. You know, why would they? Um, and people were saying that I was speaking in a different way, the content wasn't interesting, there was too much content. Um, and then finally, probably around 20 or so days into daily vlogging, um, I got some really, really good advice from somebody who at the time probably had like 300,000 followers on Instagram. Um, and she said to me, you know, your friends love you, but they don't love vlogs. So they're not your target demographic. So stop plastering all of your content across your Instagram, across your Facebook. Stop trying to growth hack those platforms because that's not where your audience live. What you need to do is figure out who your audience are and why they could be interested in your content. And that one piece of advice really did change everything for me. So I stopped the daily vlogging after shortly after that conversation, um, and then started to be more strategic with the videos that I uploaded. Wow, um, really good advice. So know your audience. Um, what's interesting to your friends isn't necessarily interesting to uh, anyone else. And um, and going from there, really interesting. Uh, lots of tips in there. Um, you, you talked about, you talked quite a lot about Instagram and some of the other social platforms. It's a little bit sort of in the news, I suppose, at the moment. It's certainly top of mind. This lockdown that we're in, I suppose, has heightened the awareness. The importance of the social platforms as mechanisms for connection has increased. Uh, but it's also criticised in many ways. And I'm, I'm painting a very broad brush because, as you uh, know better than most, each of these social channels are very different. LinkedIn is entirely different from Twitter, is entirely different from Snap, is entirely different from Instagram. So I don't want to lump them all uh, together by any means. But can you say a little bit about whether you in your work, because you work in social media, do you ever have pangs of uncertainty or quest find yourself questioning the value and worth of these platforms? And, um, and if so, you know, talk us through that. Absolutely. So a lot of our clients, you know, we work with some of the most well-known entrepreneurs, business people in the UK, um, and some of them are really, really focused on their Instagram following. Um, but ultimately, if we take a step back and look at where the attention and the social media landscape is heading, 
it's not on Instagram. So our job is to be able to help somebody future-proof their brand because ultimately we see Vine rise and fall. And it's the same with every type of platform you've seen with Facebook as well. Um, it's gonna eventually happen with Instagram. It's probably gonna, event well, it will happen with LinkedIn. It's just how this world works. Um, and what we have seen is that people can be so fixated on one platform. Um, a lot of the time it's, it's you know, more of a, a vanity thing. They see that their friends have big followings on those platforms and their business partners. So they want that too. But ultimately it's our job to, to reassure them that whilst that is important, the real priority is where your brand is gonna be in the next one or two years. And we need to make sure that you have an active following so that you can migrate cross platform when you, you need to. And that's, that is, I think, the, the main takeaway and the main thing that we're pushing to our clients right now. So what's the difference between, you used very precise words there, what's the difference between a following and an active following? So a following is a number, essentially. You could have 100,000 followers on Instagram, but you'll find that you only get, you know, 1,000 likes. And on average, you're only getting, you know, between eight and 15,000 people seeing that piece of content. And if you look at LinkedIn, or if you look at TikTok, um, so that's mainly with, with Instagram. If you look at LinkedIn or TikTok, you can have such a small following, but an incredibly engaged following. And there's also a huge network effect. If we look at LinkedIn, what happens when somebody like Craig Fenton, like sort of my posts, um, I could be talking about growing my business and how we've just hit a major milestone. Craig will like it. And all of a sudden, Craig's network of all of his past colleagues, uh, his current colleagues at, at Google and everything he's ever done, they then see on their newsfeed that Craig Fenton has liked Joe Binder's post. And a lot of people think about a like on LinkedIn as they do on any other platform. It's just a like, it does nothing. What it really is, is showing you know a sign of confidence for that person. It's showing that you support them, you agree with them, um, it's almost like a mini testimonial. It's powerful. Um, and again, that, that differs to, to TikTok as well. So essentially, every platform is just so different. Um, yeah. We talk about at Google, we talk about the difference between reach and engagement. So these days, it's easy to reach people. You can reach, you know, 4 billion people online in the world in theory uh, and, uh, and get a lot of impressions you know with uh with a social uh channel uh, it's generally sort of scrolling on your, on your phone uh, but that's very different from somebody actually engaging and maybe even answering uh or entering into a dialogue about a topic um and you do that so well it's a very very interesting distinction we've kind of uh, fallen forward into your world as a founder and ceo uh and here's your Here's your website. We build personal uh, brands for founders and CEOs. Talk us, talk us through where that idea came from and uh, how it's been as a, a founder and CEO. So the idea was informed in most part by my YouTube channel and trying to build my own personal brand online. I got that up to around 20, 22,000 followers and a total of 2 million views until I had to private the vast majority of my videos because they just didn't fit with who I am now. Um, they were me as a student at uni, and now you know I need more of a professional brand, which is why a lot of those are privated. Um, the other thing that helped start this was uh, a five and a half month job at um, a social media marketing agency where I saw, first of all, that something like LinkedIn branding could be packaged on an ongoing basis and you can actually build a business out of it. So when that company ran out of money and all of us there were out of jobs, I just thought to myself, I've always wanted to start a business. I was always the kid at school importing Dr. Dre headphones and um, Blackberry phone cases from China and selling them to friends. You know, I've always been a bit of a hustler in that respect. And I thought now is the perfect time because I have had a bit of insight into building a business, what to do, what not to do. And I also have, you know, some credentials about being able to build my own brand. So that's why I started WOW. Um, but, oh, the first few months were a disaster. A disaster to the extent where around eight months in, 
um, I actually, well, I didn't think about quitting. I started applying for jobs because I thought this is never going to happen. Um, and I had lots of different people in my ears, people that I trust and respect saying, look, you've given it a shot, but don't now waste your time on this. You're a smart guy, you know, get a job at BCG, get a job at Facebook, do something that you can actually learn from and then start a business in the future. But now it's clearly not the right time. Um, so first few months of that were, were a disaster. Um, lots more that I can talk about there, but if, if, if you want me to jump forward, I can I can do that too. So well, well actually, I, I I will have you jump forward in a moment. But uh, I hear this so much when I talk to young entrepreneurs. You know, there's there's the highs and lows at the extreme ends of the spectrum. There's the elation and jubilation of starting your own thing, being the boss, working to your own rhythm, hiring people, uh, and all of the sort of excitement and adrenaline that comes with. But there's real valleys of despair as well. And what tends to separate founders, uh, the, are, there, are their resilience uh, to, to make it through, to pivot, to adjust, and, and, and to listen to advice along the way. How, how did you get through it? I mean, because it must have been so tempting just to, uh, you know, throw in the towel. You're early in your career, you're highly qualified. You could have got a job at any of those places you mentioned. So one comment on, on the point about resilience, because I've thought about this a lot recently, uh, I think it was three weeks ago, we had a period within a team where everything that could have went wrong, went wrong. And each there around nine different incidents. Nothing was huge, but small things that, you know, a year ago would have knocked me off work for maybe three or four days just in terms of morale. Um, and it got to the point where, you know, I now have a team of people around me, a fantastic team of people, and all of these different things were happening and they were all happening so close together. And at one point, I just burst out laughing. I thought, this is brilliant because, you know, these aren't kind of, you know, company breaking problems. They can, they're all completely fixable um, and they will be fixed promptly and they won't tarnish our reputation. They won't damage the, the, the work that we're doing for our clients. It has no real, real kind of harm, but ultimately they're still, you know, fires. And I just thought, wow, one of these things would have completely knocked me off schedule, would have upset me so much. And I'm now here with 10 of them, more or less in the space of a few days. And I'm laughing about it because, because I can, because it's not getting to me anymore. You know, it just feels like you just get punched and punched nonstop in the face every single day. And eventually you stop falling over from each punch and eventually you get a little bit stronger. Um, and I've definitely seen that. So that's, that's been really cool and interesting to notice recently. In terms of how I got through it at the time, God knows, I don't know, because it is horrible. It really is, really is a challenging thing to do, um, because in the early stages when you're getting, you know, punched in the face over and over and over again, you have no defense, you have no armor, you have no context, um, and you're having to learn as you go. So it's just a constant battle against self-doubt, against imposter syndrome, um, and ultimately, just questioning the wider landscape. It's not only a case of, am I good enough? But also, is what I'm trying to do even a thing? Because it, doesn't, it didn't really exist at the time. So, so many doubts going on in my head. Um, I don't really know how I kept going. Um, but, you know, I've got my boyfriend to thank, Adam. He's, he's been there from, you know, since, since before I started the company. So, he's seen this whole journey. He's always been, you know, a rock and has kind of, been there for me throughout when I have been really, really low. So that's definitely something that I'm really grateful for. Fantastic. Well, um, uh, I should have invited Adam to, to join yeah. us at least for a little cameo there. Um, yeah, look, it's, um, it's almost those, you, you want the fires in a way, as long as they're not catastrophic and existential. Uh, those are the things that you learn from, don't you? And uh, if you if you get to the the point where your mindset is about sort of embracing those glorious failures and taking the nuggets of learning from them and moving on, then you're in a really good place. And um, aren't we all the better for it uh, that you did persevere? Because I know a little bit about the company. It's a very successful company. You've never uh, had to raise money. You bootstrapped it from the start. It's, uh, you know, I won't talk about the numbers, but it's a, it, it's a good, strongly growing, and highly profitable company. Um, how do you feel right now about where you're at and what are your current challenges? 
Good question. I I am uh, I'm buzzing as I, as I like to say to the team. I'm I'm super super excited about everything. Ten weeks ago, there were two people, including myself, in the team full time. As of today, there are four people. As of next week, there'll be five, and we're following a very similar growth trajectory over the next few months. We have really really ambitious targets to hit, um, but we're going to do it. My difficulty um, has always been creating the solid infrastructure within the company so that we can scale. I know, Craig, you've, you've given me some solid advice for this uh, in the past, but getting new business has never, thankfully, been, been an issue for us. It's always been about being able to adequately service that business. Um, and it's taken me probably two years and three months to finally understand and put that into action. What needs to happen for the business to scale? What type of people we need? What type of skill sets they need? And what their roles actually are and what they shouldn't be doing. Um, and I feel like we finally cracked that, which is why now we can essentially open the floodgates to, to the clients and really start ramping things up. Um, so I'm feeling good. Challenges are all around hiring the right people, I think. Um, I've never had, a, as I said, quite a tough start with this company. Um, and there were a lot of times where I got to the office and I wasn't enjoying it. Whereas I cannot think of a day recently where all of, you know, all of us haven't been in hysterics laughing about something. We have a really, really good time. It's such a good vibe here. I'm really enjoying it. So it's just a case of bringing more people into that and, and scaling the, the, the infrastructure of, of the business to be able to grow faster. Well, kudos to you and the team, Joe. It's a, it's a beautiful little business, uh, not so little anymore, growing strongly. And if your biggest challenge is how to meet the demand, that's, uh, that's a very good thing. How, has, how have you seen the landscape change? And there's an obvious sort of COVID question there, but I've noticed that LinkedIn as a platform, which is um, a very, you know, one of the main platforms that you work with your clients on, that's changed too quite a lot. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So over the past few years, LinkedIn has gone from, you know, a static job directory, you know, you upload your CV and recruiters contact you to the most exciting social media platform for professionals that has ever been. Um, and what that means is there is a huge opportunity to create content and to get noticed. Um, and LinkedIn are aware of that. They're a social media platform. They make money through having people spend time on the platform. And so what we have seen already and what we're going to continue seeing is them adopting different features and different strategies that we've seen work elsewhere. The most recent example of that is LinkedIn Stories, which has recently been announced. Um, and all of a sudden, we have a new Instagram, but on LinkedIn. So, of course, the content isn't going to be the exact same as Instagram. Um, but this is a very, very clear statement from LinkedIn about the direction that they're heading um, and about the, the, the type of usership that they've seen over the past few months and years. Um, social media is becoming more and more in the moment. It's becoming less polished and they're aware of that um, and they know that if they make the right changes they will be able to keep more people on the platform for longer so that's one interesting transition um, that I've seen in terms of COVID um, I think you know you can just anyone anyone listening can look on their newsfeed and see so many people posting right now and so many more people um, than you know than pre pre-march um, I think if we look at LinkedIn specifically, the main reason for that is because this huge in-person networking piece can no longer be done. You can't go and speak at events. You can't go and meet people over coffee. And so what do you do? You pivot your strategy and you pivot your networking somewhere that it can be scaled, and that's, that's LinkedIn. So whilst it can, for the moment, replace the in-person side, it also has the potential to give you and your reputation exponential growth and I think once people have tested that out and have seen the benefits which they are now doing they're not gonna they're not gonna go back they're gonna continue pushing LinkedIn um, as a platform yeah. well I, I love LinkedIn it's my primary and favorite professional platform I, I do use Instagram as well but more for personal stuff but LinkedIn I find to be a really high quality platform um, you get great engagement and I love it for its power to, uh, to meet people and also start a dialogue. 
I tried a story the other day, by the way, Joe. You'll be proud. Should we do one now? Yeah, yeah. let's do it. Sorry, let me get back. let me get my phone as well. Yeah, there you go. We'll, we'll both do one. Yeah. What? I'm gonna there go next. Go. Yeah. I'm here with the magical Craig Fenton on his podcast, Coffee Exit Inspiration. We are filming this right now and it will be out very soon. Live. <laughs> Love to see it. Love to see it. Awesome. Okay. I've just shared that. So in real time, um, this is a recording, so it'll go out. You'll be able to look back. Oh, no, you won't because the stories disappear anyway. <laughs> um, hopefully somebody will see it today. Listen, let's end, if we may, Joe, with some advice. I want you to give a mini masterclass to anyone listening who's thinking about building their personal brand on LinkedIn or uh, another of the social channels. What are your top tips? Great question. Do I have a minute, two minutes? Let's say one minute. One minute from now. Okay, so if you want to build your personal brand and you're worried about what people might think, or what to post, I would think of a couple of different things. First of all, imagine you have a WhatsApp group with professional colleagues, mentors, people that you mentor. What kind of things would you share to that WhatsApp group? Would you share the latest news on FinTech, the latest news on crypto? Would you share your learnings, something that you're, you know, is really challenging you at the moment? Um, think about what you would put into that WhatsApp group that those people would be interested in, um, and then think, okay, how can I repurpose that exact same content, that concept for LinkedIn? which would mean writing a bit more information and probably having a convincing call to action at the end to ask people to engage. The second part, um, again, is if you had a room full of people and you were standing on stage, you can talk to them about whatever you want with the overarching aim of helping your career mission. What are you going to speak to them about and who's in that room? Take that concept and then apply it to content creation on LinkedIn. And that's a minute, so I can't speak anymore. Those are my kind of two main tips mainly around confidence and um, and content ideation. Well, it's all, all about leaving the audience hungry, isn't it, Joe? So knowing your audience, um, engaging them in content that they might want to hear, I think fantastic uh, tips. And I've seen, uh, I've seen the advice that you give, and I've been the beneficiary of it as well uh, many times. It's fantastic. Go check Joe's uh, company out. Wow is the name. I'll link everything below. Joe Bonner, you're an inspiration. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Craig. It's been an absolute pleasure.